Well, uh, if, if Amory is going to leave in a half hour, should we get started? Yes. 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 Good. Yes. Forgive me for being so abrupt. Yeah, uh, thank you. <laughs> I would like, and partly because these passages are so timely today, 70 years later, mm. uh, I'd like to read two passages to you just to get us launched. Uh, in this book that I mentioned, uh, Barry Selesky's Frilla Getty, The Artist in His Time. The one has to do with, uh, Frilla Getty, you know, published Howell. Mm -hmm. And then uh, about 500 copies were seized from his shop. The fellow who led that, uh, Chester McPhee was collector of customs in San Francisco, and he he saw the book and had the copy seized. And his explanation was the words and the sense of the writing is obscene, and you wouldn't want your children to come across it. And so he he ordered the 520 copy seats. And the, the next 12 pages of this book describe the ordeal that Perlinghetti and Ginsburg went through uh, of uh, the obscenity trials that followed. But this was the first one, and it was eventually dismissed. At any rate, great. So Selesky says Perlinghetti wasn't taken by surprise. Before the manuscript had even gone to the printer suspecting trouble, he had contacted the ACLU and asked if they would defend it in court if need be. On April 3rd, they, the ACLU, told McPhee and his in customs that they did not consider the book obscene and would contest the seizure. Meanwhile, Ferlin Getty made arrangements to have an entire new photo offset edition of Howell printed within the United States, thus circumventing customs. And this is this is a passage that's really powerful. On May 19th, William Hogan a writer for the San, uh, San Francisco Chronicle, gave his Sunday Chronicle column to Perlin Getty to write a defense of Ginsburg's work. Uh, Perlin Getty wrote, and this is Perlin Getty's editorial he's quoting, it is not the poet, but what he observes, which is revealed as obscene. The great obscene wastes of Howell are the sad wastes of the mechanized world lost among atom bombs and insane nationalisms. Ginsburg chooses to walk on the wild side of this world along with Nelson Algren, Henry Miller, Kenneth Rexroth, Kenneth Patchy, not to mention some great American dead, mostly in the tradition of philosophical anarchism. Ginsburg wrote his own best defense of how in the poem itself. And I love this ploy that as defense, he quotes the poem. Roland Getty does. Here he asks, what sphinx, of, this is Ginsburg now, what sphinx of cement and aluminum bashed upon their skulls and ate up their brains and imagination? Moloch, solitude, filth, ugliness, ash cans and unobtainable dollars, children screaming under stairways, boys sobbing in armies, old men sleep, uh, weeping in the parks. And Roland Getty's back now, a world in short, you wouldn't want your children to come across. Mm. Thus was Goya obscene in depicting the disasters of war, thus Whitman an exhibitionist exhibiting man in his own strange skin. In, for, in one short uh, passage, uh, I don't know if anyone has ever written a better defense of uh, obscenity in literature. The other passage that I'd like to read you is, um, Perlin Getty on the nature of contemporary poetry and what he believed that he, the beat poets and the San Francisco group uh, achieved. So it starts, this is Selesky, in a February 1957 issue, the national news magazine, The Nation, published the Perlin Getty poem. And in Chicago, uh, Urban Rosenthal and Paul Carroll, the young editors of the Chicago Review, had taken note of the new writing and conceived a San Francisco issue. The spring 1958 issue contained Kerouac's introductory essay, et cetera, et cetera. 
and a poem by Ferland Getty and his note on poetry in San Francisco. So Ferland Getty published a poem and then he added, added this uh, explanation. So Ferland Getty says, there are all kinds of poets here writing very dissimilar types of poetry as this issue ought to show. But I should say that the kind of poetry which has been making the most noise here is quite different from the poetry about poetry, the poetry of technique, the poetry for poets and professors, which has dominated the quarterlies and anthologies in this country for some time, which of course is also written in San Francisco. <laughs> the poetry which has been making itself heard here of late is what should be called street poetry. For it amounts to getting the poet out of the inner aesthetic sanctum where he has too long been contemplating his complicated navel. It amounts to getting poetry back into the street where it once was, out of the classroom, out of the speech department, and in fact, off the printed page. The printed word has made poetry so silent. The poetry I am talking about here is spoken poetry, poetry conceived as oral messages. It makes it aloud. Some of it has been read with jazz, much of it has not. A new Afghan school he questions, rock and roll, who cares what names it's called? What's important is that this poetry is using its eyes and ears as they have not been used for a number of years. Poetry about poetry like much non-objective painting has caused an atrophy of the artist's senses. I walked through Chinatown recently with a, right, with a famous academic poet, and he never saw the whole schools of fish gasping on counters, nor heard what they breathe. Mm -hmm. Just an interesting passage on what he thought they were achieving. So, you wanna look at some poems? Sure. Or comments, folks? Uh, I really, uh, first of all, I have to just say, uh, I love that phrase. <laughs> oh my God, I'm going to laugh about this for days. That street poetry gets the poet out away from their complicated navels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fabulous. Oh my God. I, for one, have been navel gazing for the last two years. So I needed to hear that. I needed to hear that. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> well, everything that I've re read about Perlin Getty says that he was just this lovely man, this gentle man. And those, these two passages that I read, I love the outrage in them and his lament about what the school room and I've been in it, what the classroom has done to poetry and printing has done to poetry. Wow. <laughs> so how about if we look at spring about to happen? Yes. I, after I begged off, then I decide. <laughs> well, the title is just right for right now. Got it. I'll be I'll be happy to read it unless someone else would like to. And I, I guess that was a silence of acclamation. Yes, please read. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Ron, will you read that for us? <laughs> Hence, spring about to happen. Handsome cab through Central Park, clop clop. White horse pulling the old open carriage. Cabby on the seat in his high hat, dead asleep. No one in the cab. The horse slows to a stop at the curb. The cabbie keeps sleeping. A couple climbs in, the cabbie awakes. Where away? Anywhere, cry the two together, wrapped in each other. I'm going to read that part again. <laughs> Anywhere, cry the two together, wrapped in each other. Spring is about to happen. A flight <laughs> of dirty doves takes off from the still bare trees. The eternal coachman moves his reins. Plop, plop, goes the horse. Kiss, kiss, cry the birds in a song without words. Hmm. Given the stuff that he talks about in his passage on Howl, you know, 
I think it's always a bit more of a challenge to write a poem of celebration, a paean. And I like, I like the images he chooses and uh, what's in the air of the poem that he writes. It has a lot of wonderful images and sounds um, mm -hmm. throughout it. Mm -hmm. Kiss, kiss, cries the birds in a song without words. That's lovely. Clop, well, clop. and the coming alive, even the cabbie waking up to mm -hmm. uh, the, the couple joining him. Mm. Which makes the horse the smart one. The horse sees there's customers. Yeah. The horse pulls over. <laughs> Well, and the eternal coachman moves his reins. It's not just happening in Central Park. It's the spirit of the universe. Mm. I'll go out on a limb and say this one disappoints me. I, I like him when he's more on edge, I think. No, I know I like him better when he, he's on edge as opposed to quietness in this one. What does on edge mean, Amory? What what are you seeing? A sharpness, a brittleness. Um, um, I, this is just is so pastoral, even though we're in the middle of the city, but so pastoral and gentle. Well, it definitely feels like a captured moment, uh, perhaps one that he personally witnessed. Uh, whether or not he did, that's how it feels to me when I read it. Another thing that I find interesting is um, the amount of energy that's going on between the, the cabbies and the couple. And I think that there's a nice contrast there. Um, you know, we're coming out of a sleepy winter, but somehow when the sun comes out, and the weather warms up, uh, you just want to take a nap in the <laughs> afternoon for some reason. But not this couple. This couple is going to um, <clears throat> start spring. <laughs> They're going to get some spring on. And it's, uh, I think that's interesting, uh, that dynamic between uh, the differences between the cabbies and the, the couple. I don't know. Great. I like the okay. image of, of love. Where are they going? Uh, cry, any, they don't care. They're wrapped in each other. And that was an interesting playoff too. Great title, Spring About to Happen. I mean, <laughs> really captures yeah. what he's saying in the poem. Um, I like how he starts off with a clop clop in the beginning and ends it with a clop clop goes the horse kiss kiss cries the bird it's sort of like he picks it up somewhere um gives us a little snapshot of what's going on and then he's able to wrap it up with that's just a little moment in spring about to happen with a lot of other things and they're not giving up an hour of sleep <laughs> <laughs> or at least the gabby isn't I'm curious about the three words, the eternal coachman. That phrase to me, that word eternal, to me just begs, says, here, here, this is a this is a a point. I'm making I'm making some kind of very big sweeping point. Yeah. I don't know if it's a I call it a customary personification of death, but I, 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 I've heard the phrase used about death. I, I couldn't tell you where, uh, or life for that matter. The spirit that permeates. You, there's, a, there's a lot of poetry written about what drives us. You know, and you know who's in charge of what's moving us. You know who's who's pointing us in a direction. 
kind of thing. You know, our, is it our mind in charge? Is it the coachman? <clears throat> you know, who's, or is it the horses? You know, who's, who's taking us where we're going? And that is an eternal question. So maybe it's the cabbie on the seat in his high hat dead asleep. Maybe the cabbie is spring and he's waking up because, you know, spring <laughs> is eternal. Um, and now we're coming up on spring because uh, earlier there, there <laughs> probably wasn't any point of having it, you know, doing a cab ride. Well, maybe in the wintertime you, you do a cab ride, you're wrapped up, but this one's a little bit different. I like that idea. Yeah. And then he's moving them forward. Yeah. So I guess my point is the rest of the poem seems like this lovely snapshot that I can easily see. I can hear it having been <coughs> next to places in Central Park. I can I just I can hear that sound. And in some ways that's plenty enough. And that phrase, the eternal coachman to me says, no, it means more than that. You have to think about this. Who's guiding us, who's leading us? Is the coachman death, life? Both. That's why I, I was thinking spring because every year we have spring. So this, this coachman is representing spring. Mm -hmm. Too bad we can't ask him. <laughs> He waited a long time for us, what, 102 years? Yeah. <laughs> okay, someone uh, want to pick another poem and read it? What was the other one you mentioned, Ron? Uh, between two cities, but that might be too cheerful. <laughs> too what? Oh, too lyrical. Too cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a very imagistic poem, but somebody else choose. I I think we can talk about it, but it's pretty small. It's short, and it's right there, right after the other one. Yeah, how convenient. <laughs> I'll I'll read it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, between two cities, brown stubble cornfields by a railroad crossing with sign reading uneven tracks, bare elms like fans against the sky, furries with birds in a thicket about to fly, a genre farm painting flashes in my inward eye brown cows by a barn in sun, with a dog at play, the lone and level fields stretch away. Bernice, did I say that right? Bernice? Bernice? I thought it was hers, but I didn't look at her. Up. Okay, I thought as the as Z E might be a whoop, might be a an upward. Furs is a prickly evergreen shrub. Ah, okay. Oh, I gave it a little flare then. Sorry about that. Maybe it needed it. <laughs> I think Ferlinghetti would say, or some some people would say, Emery, that that's a rhyme, furs with furs. But it's a very strong echo, if not a rhyme. I'm going to the door. It's answer the doorbell. <clears throat> By the way, this is International Day of the Woman. Yay. I learned. <laughs> if a woman had written this yeah. poem, how would it be accepted? I'm just wondering. It's pretty bare. <clears throat> Using very common words except for furs. I'm just throwing that in in honor yeah. of International Women's Day <laughs> for the conversation. I think this is the kind of poem, well, Emily Dickinson has poems like this, although they're not arranged this way. And certainly uh, Amy Lowell and H.D. Hilda Doolittle. 
have very imagistic poems of this kind, descriptive? Well, I think one of Margaret Atwood's poems used furs. So this is the second time I've seen it. Oh, yeah, that's right. Good catch. You know, what I didn't the... help but feel the brown stubble cornfields by a railroad crossing with a sign reading uneven tracks is a metaphor for something it is not to be read literally it had i feel that tug from it that there there's something about that scene it's like frost desert places and uh yeah it has that feel to me mm. It's like a piece of land that's transitional between the city <clears throat> and between the rural areas. And, you know, riding on a, um, a train even from here uh, down to Tacoma, you can see, uh, you know, riding the trains are really interesting because you have some beautiful scenes and then you have these real industrial um, places that are where you feel like you're in the middle of something transitional. I think the key word, the action word here in this poem, the action phrase is stretch away the last two words of the poem. And then he's got four dots after that. Uh, so there, yeah, there is a sense that he's driving by this scene and perhaps he's, I'm wondering if he's saying um, some sort of a statement about the future of, of farming and the, that farming life and those those scenes, if he's if he's wondering they're going to go away, or if he's happy they're there. Oh. Well, there are two lines in the poem, at least two, and he likes to do this in his poetry uh, that are allusions. Uh, the inward eye is from Wordsworth. Flash upon oh. that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude, from. Uh, the daffodils poem and the lone and level fields that's that's Shelley's Ozymandias the lone and level sands stretch far away at the end of Ozymandias and it, it, it feels of course very very deliberate I'm glad your professor self is here Ron because I never would have picked that up even though I've read those poems so that that really gives different different insight. He's probably tossing a bone to the professorship. <laughs> See you if know, you recognize this one, guys. Stubble. <laughs> when I read the word stubble, I think of a man's beard, and when I think of brown stubble, like stubble, I think of a young man's beard. To me. This poem starts out with telling, with the poet telling us this is a young man who is standing watching the world go by him, and that there, and that it's telling him that the world is a very uneven place. That that would be the way I would would start this poem, and everything else from there would tell me that. This man, this is talking about something other than a than what it's saying. So, what I'm reading into it is is what's not there. I'm thinking about the cities, and when you're standing in the city, you feel like this is all encompassing. <clears throat> what the world is like um, it is all crowded and noisy and full of people. Uh, Yet the reality is there are those great stretches of nothing in between. <laughs> um, every time I'm driving back from Eastern Washington on I-90, there's a, there's a point at which you are still so much in the mountains and it's so, well, it's so much still in the mountains and you pass a sign that says something like Seattle 10 miles. And it's incredible to me that, that you can go from the, the barrenness of whether that's talking about the, the woods or the fields, and then all of a sudden there's city. Mm -hmm. Amory, you know, uh, for years of spending hours and hours and hours in airplanes, 
and looking down, it, it, that's one of the things that I never really ever reconciled in my mind was this, that process that you're flying over nothing over for hours and mm -hmm. all of a sudden there's a city. And then they, you fly again for hours and all of a sudden there's a city. It's yeah. just, it, to me, it never stopped being shocking. There was an aerial picture of the, the city of Leavenworth recently. And it was taken at, in such a way that the mountains look so craggy and, and, and stark there. And then there's this little clump of lights in the middle of that, that sense. So anyhow. That's, that's where my mind is, that, that the world really is full of lots of these more barren areas without a sign of the cities that we know that are there. Is this in this poem, Amory? Are you picking this, this idea up out of this poem? No, it's just what, well, like, it's what triggers it. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out what it was in it. Is it the fact that the genre are farm paintings? Is it what? It, because my mind is going there also. And so I'm trying to figure out what it is the poet has, the poet poem has said that has taken our minds there. Um, well, in my mind's there too, because of the, the railroad crossing, it immediately put me on the train. And immediately, um, and the bear elms, the bear land. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What does the a genre farm painting do to your understanding of the reality of this image? As your is that real, or is that a genre farm painting of, or are we using up the land? as it stretches away is the loan in the it's no longer there betty is that what you're saying yeah i'm wondering mm -hmm. and i just picked that up just listening and looking at that line i think that's kind of a pivot in this in the poem i see one two three four five six seven the ninth uh line yeah what i get out of that is that it is um he's kind of that's his perception of uh, of this world because it says flashes on my inward eye brown cows by a barn in the sun in in sun he doesn't actually see that except for in his mind but what he sees is cornfields and this sign reading uneven tracks and then there's this um, uh, dissection of of this scene. And he's just imagining that there's going to be maybe on on over the hill. There's brown cows standing by a barn, and uh, with the dog playing. Cows brown. Pardon me. Why are the cows brown? That's his. I think that's his mind. His mind is saying that's what a normal farm life would look like. Are, mo are the cows that we usually see in a picture brown? No. I think they're brown it. cows because that's what is in the genre. Oh, now brown cow. Brown uh, cows. <clears throat> I'm sorry, that it's black and white. That has to do with what this poem is saying. <clears throat> well, the whole poem is brown. It's a brown stubble. It's got brown cows. I bet you the dog's brown, although we don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's a study in brown. Uh, to me, uh, the poem, it, it's like someone has stopped with a camera to capture a scene that has this series of objects. And it, then his inward eye, the kind of ideal genre painting appears, maybe in contrast, but maybe also as a rendering. Mm. If, I keep wondering the brown stubble then. Is the brown because we're talking that, that all of this is being observed by a young man? Mm. Mm. Well, Only well, Lawrence Fernand Getty can answer that question. <laughs> What's with the brown, Larry? <laughs> this poem makes me think of William Carlos Williams. Yeah, me too. 
Mm -hmm. I thought the same That's thing. Why, Linda. Yeah. Because William Carlos Williams' eye was kind of a camera, mm -hmm. and he focused on images, and there is a lot of imagistic reference mm -hmm. in this poem. Mm. And you can also extrapolate some further meaning. I mean, I think the title Between Two Cities, that's plain spoken enough, but it could also be extended as a metaphor for something maybe we don't understand or need to think about. Mm. I don't want to make too much of it, but I do think there's more here than is initially grasped. What do you think about these two phrases uh, that contra uneven tracks, level fields? The, the tracks, which are man made, are uneven. And there's a warning sign. But the, the level fields sound ideal. They sound uh, almost perfect in a sense where he's placed them. Mm -hmm. But they're also man-made because of the, in nature there are very few level fields. So mm -hmm. the level would be a farm, you think? Yeah. yeah, that poem would be titled "Between Two Farms." You think Getty <laughs> is laughing at us right now? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting that whoever put up the sign that that was their solution. They didn't even the tracks; <laughs> they put up the sign. <laughs> you know. But it is like two cities who are developing at different rates, doing different things. And as they get larger and larger, they encroach upon each other. There's that unevenness that develops between them because it's really hard to make that that shift to kind of um, uh, put them together evenly. So, you know, there were different things that each city was doing. So now you have these tracks that are coming together unevenly. You have this border that's um, in transition which we find ourselves a lot of times in life. You know, I, I was thinking between two jobs, I could write that one right now. <laughs> yeah, with me, it was marriages. <laughs> <laughs> different, different number, I believe. Same thing, Ron. Ron, I'm waiting for your poem on marriages. <laughs> <laughs> How many pages, Ron? <laughs> it's an epic. <laughs> Not finished yet. <laughs> Does it rhyme? <laughs> it's an iambic pentameter. It's slant it's rhyme, I guarantee. Oh. Is there a lot of imagery? <laughs> Ooh, I hope not. I want to no, never mind. <laughs> Just um, thinking bedroom scenes, that's all. <laughs> <sighs> Didn't okay, see that edit. coming. That was fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good For us. It's been a while. It's been a while no. since I laughed about it. <laughs> Well, maybe that's your en route to a to a marriage poem is laughing about it. Oh, yeah, that could be a sign of healing. That's good. Make it a slam poem. <laughs> I can't quite see Ron doing slam poetry, but that would be entertaining. <laughs> I've made a lot of, I think, sardonic and at least wry comments about my uh, marital adventures. Uh, yes. But I don't think I've said to you folks that I, I have a really nice friendship with each of my former wives. Oh. Yeah, but now I have enough friends, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's good to hear. That really yeah. is. That too is an adventure. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. A journey, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've done justice to Pro and Yeti, so I don't think I don't feel a strong need to look at all the poems. But yeah, your call, we, folks. Yeah, I don't feel a strong need either. I so I really we, appreciate we have them. About him, though. What? I said I really appreciate learning more about Ferengetti and his uh, and his work, and diving into the lines and. He's, it's interesting. Yeah. And now I have the San Francisco poem, which I just might have to frame. Thanks. <laughs>